in the movie, right? Nick's attitude, it's similar to me, but I am in a real life world, I'm much more talkative, like in the actual locker room. Like I'm actually friendly with people and, and other, other humans and everything like that. Um, the, uh, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but as a goalie, right? So especially at a drop in, there's no way you're getting to know anyone else unless it's the situation like that, where it's just one other guy, two other guys. Cause otherwise you're just in the net and people on the bench get to know each other. That's that's why, that's why we're all weirdos and everything. Yeah, I'm fun yet. Welcome to this week's episode of the Late Game Podcast. I'm Jeffrey M. Zucker, co-creator, producer, actor in the Late Game, along with my business partner, co-creator, director, writer, Jeff Tyner. How's it going, baby? Doing all right. Just uh, got back in town, and we'll get to that shortly. But, um, you know, figured we could start off with our beer league game from Monday night. Um, you know, wasn't a smiling affair, if you will, when we departed, but... Yeah, I was about to say, not the funnest way to start. It was a loss, and it was a, uh, excuse me, um, yeah, just a, uh, we just got beat, top to bottom. Yeah, it was, it, uh, and it was technically a Shane playoff Farmer game. Shane Devin, because <clears throat> um, he played great. That was about the only area I don't think we were totally outplayed. But yeah, it was pretty yeah. rough. Um, not the best game either from my end. I mean, yeah, Devin was subbing for us, our former full-time goalie. He was fucking awesome, especially for being off the ice for like four months. It's pretty crazy. Um, despite that, you know, we managed to lose six to one. We were just sluggish and I don't know, man. It just didn't look like we really had a shot against them most of the game. Um, I think it was weird because it was Memorial Day. So like everybody felt like it was a Sunday and we're used to playing when it feels like Monday. And, you know, we can make all excuses all day, but we didn't play very well. Um, that said, I don't think any of us take it too seriously. Plus the playoff, um, format at big bear that makes no sense means that we will still play on Monday. And the way that I'm reading the bracket, which isn't particularly clear is that if we win this loser game, we still end up in the championship. It's very confusing. Yeah. That's what Reese told me. I just, I just nod, nod along. That sounds fine. Um, makes sense that it wouldn't make sense at big bear. Um, but other than just like, yeah, we weren't meshing, couldn't complete a pass. It, it was the team that Bo and Devin know pretty well. So it at least wasn't chippy. I mean, it was a little physical, um, but it was still a pretty clean beer league game. I saw a guy had around. you in like a headlock for a minute in front of the net. Not a headlock, but I do remember someone trying to like wrap me up Yeah. Um, at one point and I kind of threw him off me and then all he said was good battle and I was just whatever it was <laughs> if I'm if it was late in the game I was kind of over it like my last couple of shifts I just kind of went puck hog style and I was just like passing it wasn't working the whole game so I just kind of tried to see what could happen and uh so I but yeah I mean speaking to the Memorial Day of it all just from the start of the game I felt I, I felt like I had way more legs in the third period than the first two like I it was I think part of that might have been the game time too combined with some Memorial Day burgers um but yeah, it was just kind of a weird game. Um, but overall, it was fine. Yeah. I mean, I kind of liked when you started to to go all out at the end. They were thinking like you and Reese and, you know, a couple of the better guys were like frustrated that nothing was working. They're like, I'm just going to, you know, that doesn't always work in real hockey to just try and do it yourself, but at least could have gotten us on the scoreboard. We got closer. Yeah. I mean, um, I wish I knew the goalie's name because he subbed for us in game one, but he's a good goalie. I just, you know, I I had four or five chances that I felt like, any of those could have been goals, but he just uh, made the saves. I want to say he's um, a, his name is Sully. I, I want to say from when he subbed, but sorry if I'm wrong. I, I, I'm going with Sully. I like that. Um, and Therese, yeah, man, like it's just how the game shook out. I feel like if I had time to look up, I never saw Reese the whole game. Like I just feel like our shifts weren't lining up um, because we only had we had four D and two two centers. So I felt like unfortunately we were on opposite ends of the bench. And like my worst turnover of the game was like the one shift I had with Reese and I saw him at the point, like there was no pass, but I was just like, fuck it. Reese is over there. Let's, let's try to get something going. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's tough. And I mean, we obviously, I'm not saying we would make lines beforehand if everybody like said if they were coming early or not, but it's everybody, so many people are last minute. So it's like, even if we wanted to prepare, it'd be tough. Yeah. It's just how it, I, I kind of, 
go on like we shouldn't think too hard about it you know i feel like big plans blow up in your face for beer league like let's just let's just skate you know but yeah just no gel no continuity no i mean just no passes were being completed the whole time yeah well hopefully we will make up for it next week and you know i'd mentioned traveling i just got back from chicago where uh, last night at the Wilmette Theater, uh, the Ice Donkeys hosted us for a late game watch party. Um, it was a lot of fun. Um, Dave Heiser and Michael Myers of the Ice Donkeys uh, are the ones that brought us in. And they actually, when the trailer first came out, like before the movie was out, they commented on the trailer, like, we want to host a, a watch party or a screening or whatever in Wilmette. And so I was like, yeah, email us. And we've been, you know, kind of just talking a little bit here and there for months and then we finally got our shit together and mostly on our side uh just because we've been busy but um you know i learned a little bit about uh, the group and uh ice donkeys the team started like i think they said in 2010 so around 14 years ago um and maybe it was longer sorry guys if i have that wrong but um basically a bunch of guys whose kids were playing hockey they wanted to start playing so it's a it started off as a lot of newbies like more people have joined them over the years that do have more hockey experience and they've split off into a second like more skilled team as well um they got some some big canadian dudes in the mix that i got to hang out with last night um and yeah i mean overall it seems like they've built a really cool atmosphere where like some guys, you know, who had never played hockey, now it's a big part of their life, you know, but it happened when they were 40s or 50s. Um, and that's always fun to see just how hockey can always bring people together, um, regardless of the age. And uh, they were raising money with this event for Pucks for Autism. Um, so it was cool to work with that organization. Um, they, they had someone there that, that said something, I'm really sorry, I don't remember your name. And um, yeah, happy to dig in more. Curious uh, what, what you want to know, but uh, plenty more to share on it. It was, um, you know, certainly Tyler and I were both there. We've both been at, I think, all of these. Uh, maybe there's ones we've done without Tyler, but um, we it's probably our second favorite after Denver. Jealous. Um, I didn't know the team was named the Ice Donkeys. I fucking love that. That's cool. Um, loved seeing a full a full room to see it. Um, love the enthusiasm. I saw a Reddit comment from someone that was there. Um, I sent that screenshot to you. So that was cool. Yeah. This guy, Bob, that I met last night said he was going to talk about it on Reddit. So it's probably Bob. So if so, thank you. Um, and it, yeah, so yeah, it was a good one. We were sorry to miss you. Um, you know, sorry that we didn't have more guys there, but it just, it didn't make financial sense, you know, trying to do what we could for the charity, et cetera. Um, and, and, you know, your schedule and everything, but it was, um, full house at this theater. I don't know. There's probably a hundred people or so in there. And I'm um, just like cool old theater that was, you know, over a hundred years old, um, next to a greasy spot. I used to go when I lived in the area, Chuck wagon, got to, uh, have a burger that uh, provided some deliciousness and nostalgia. Um, and yeah, I mean, I know they raised a fair amount of money for the cause. Um, they sold 85 to hundred tickets somewhere in that neighborhood. And, um, people loved the film they showed some of their low lights that were basically like live barn cuts uh for five minutes before we started i love uh, that yeah that was pretty fun and there, there were some awesome. really good clips in there um god and yeah myers one of the guys who, who helped apparently he's known for tripping over every line on the ice so they had <laughs> some, some good highlights of people tripping over the lines and like their joke is that they're really terrible and like they they've they've celebrated their hundredth loss and they also celebrated their first win and drank a bottle of Pappy Van Winkle um, when they had their first win. So uh, it's, a, it's a fun community. I love to hear that. I love to hear people getting into the game late, later in life because it's, it's not easy. And it's a testament to someone's enjoyment that they can ignore the hard parts of it and just enjoy it. Yeah. Definitely. And that actually reminds me that when they first started, they were doing kind of their sessions, their ice sessions would be like half skills with a coach because they're all new. And then the second half was scrimmaging. That's smart. That's a good way to learn. Yeah. I thought, I thought it was really cool. And, um, you know, I'd skated at a couple of rinks that some of them had skated at when I was in the Chicago area. So it was fun to reminisce on that front. Um, you know, lots of Hawks fans there, of course. And um, overall, like, we'd love to do more work with them. They seem like a growing community. 
and uh, they were super fun hosts. Um, we went to this this great bar before and after pit and tap around the corner, um, super convenient, if you will. <laughs> and uh, there was one other thing I was gonna. I, it was you know it's cool to be an old school theater. We got to hook up like directly to this huge projector and stuff. It was it, it was a fun atmosphere, good good vibe there, and. Um, I think that, you know, we talked a lot about just how they can help the movie and it was just, please be, if you like it, be an ambassador for us in the community, let hockey people know about it. And, um, so I think we got some, some fans on our hands and moved a couple jerseys some posters and met a lot of really cool people. Love to hear it. Yeah. I mean, if you like the movie, please just talk, talk it up in the room, get the guys to see it. Cause, uh, you know, we're just trying to get it on as many eyes as possible. Yep, exactly. And, um, you know, we hope to have some more watch parties coming up. Definitely stay tuned to our various platforms, uh, to find out, but we have a few more cities at the least that we'd like to hit. And also, you know, if you or someone, you know, that's listening, if you want to bring us to town, um, you know, reach out to contact at the late And, uh, we're happy to, to figure out something if it makes sense for, for all of us. And, um, we love getting in local hockey communities. Yeah. I think that's the way to go going forward. I'd love to do more stuff like that, right, right to the source. Agreed. And, um, you know, otherwise on the hockey front, uh, Czechia won the world championships. Um, we've got the ongoing conference finals that have looked pretty good so far. Yeah. Um, like I said, I've been watching super closely, but I saw that brawl that happened after first goal in Florida and New York. Uh, I don't know if you saw this. I only saw very briefly, before I was traveling. It was fun. It was good to see. I mean, uh, I kind of liked it all the way around. Like, uh, just, uh, that was classic playoff hockey. And I love Vinny Trocek. He's the one who scored the goal. And then he got, got kind of dummied by Kachuk. But what I loved is that he gets up from it and he's just smiling the whole time because he just scored at home. So it's like, who cares? <laughs> Maybe that was the road game. I think it was at home, but I don't know. Either way, it was still fun. Yeah, they were in Florida last night. And um, so... You know, Trocek used to play for the Panthers, you know, not with Kachuk, but it's been cool to see how well he's been playing. I'm sure it gives him a little extra push. Yeah, I he took a step back after that injury, so I'm really glad to see. I've always liked him since I didn't even know who he was until that North America under-23 team. Um, and I just I love watching him play, so I'm really glad he's back to his old self. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, he had some off time, but... Got his shit together. Love to see it. Um, curious to see where the playoff goes. I don't. I don't really have a dog in the fight personally. I have stories I can root for on pretty much any of the teams. Yeah, it's a good way to look at it. Yeah, and I always like to see the stories that come out of the cup. There's always, you know, you don't realize how much it's really impacting so many lives in and out of or on and off the ice. Um, so that'll be cool to see, and we'll keep our eye on it. And um, you know. I forget there was some – oh, uh, you had me watch that Danny McBride, like, interview on a podcast. Um, oh, the GQ thing, or the or was it a podcast? Well, so you sent me some great Danny McBride content we watched. GQ, where he's, like, going over his characters that he's played in his various hits, and then um, the other one was uh, Shane Gillis's podcast, and it was old, but – but yeah, it just really got my, you know, my film excitement going, excited for, you know, what we can do beyond the late game as much as we're always still going to work on it. Definitely. No, that's, I get similar feelings, man. Yeah, that was a, the fun podcast. And then shout out to our sound mixer, Susan Brand, for doing the sound for the GQ video. That was, I just had that on, um, on YouTube and I, they, they have the credits pop up at the end and I was just like. I was kind of out of it. I was folding clothes or something and just like, I was like, Oh, Oh my God. Oh my God. They must've shot that in Charleston. So that was, that was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it was awesome to see and like him talking about moving to Charleston and, and living there. And yeah, definitely Susan, um, the best, uh, she's certainly GQ material. I could have told you that. 100%. And you know, we also, uh, in terms of what we're watching, we went to see Furiosa this weekend and we, we haven't talked a ton about it since. I know. Yeah. I'm, uh, I've talked a little bit about it with Wadi. Um, I loved it. I have learned a little bit more behind the scenes since we watched it. Um, apparently it was written before Fury Road came out, but George Miller was kind of dicked over when it came to back end on Fury Road. So it just like really delayed this production. Cause I, 
the, the original thought must have had, been to have Charlize Theron play the role, but it's what nine years, you know? So, um, <clears throat> it had pretty disappointing box office numbers too, which really breaks my heart. Cause this is the kind of movie I want to see more of. Yeah. So the box office as a whole is, yeah. I mean, same with, with, yeah. Fall guy. Like I want to see, those are the kind of movies I want to see more of. Um, but and I definitely want to see more from George Miller and the Mad Max universe. And I thought Furiosa was great. I think it was like, if I'm grading it out, if Fury Road, I think Fury Road is one of the most perfect examples of a movie. Um, it's visual storytelling, pace, editing, all of it. That If that's a 10, I think I'd give Furiosa a 9. Just just a little bit under. Um, but, but like Anna Taylor-Joy, that's her name? Or Joy Taylor? She was yeah, great. Um, she brought she brought all, it, she wasn't in the movie as much as I expected, but she brought a lot to it. And I just I loved it, man. That was a treat. Uh, as someone who's less into the franchise as me, like what was your thoughts kind of going into it cold? Well, when you were first talking about how she like wasn't in the movie as much as we expected, I agree. I really like how they handled like the transition from the younger actor to her cuz so like you basically couldn't tell when it happened just cuz of what was going on and what they're wearing and stuff so I thought that was a lot better than if it was like oh it's a reveal this act cuz that takes you out of it um so I thought they did a good job with that overall yeah I mean Fury Road I I felt <clears throat> I thought it was a lot of fun like I love an action spectacle um I thought I mean I thought it was good like I thought it was really cool action stuff to watch but like I'm not like a giant fan of the um, franchise. So like it wasn't, you know, knowing what it is now would have been okay with me not seeing it, but like, it was pretty cool to see. Yeah. I would say between this and Fury Road, that's like almost the most connective tissue that's in any of two of the movies of this franchise. Like, even though there are, there are connective tissue in the Mel Gibson trilogy and then going into Fury Road. But what I like, and I've, I've, played the video game which is incredible it's one of my favorite of all time um so that was cool there were a couple of video game characters that were in furiosa that hadn't been seen before um shout out the chum bucket and scrotus um <laughs> but i grew up on the road warrior as like one of my it's like insane to think about how young i was watching like tv cuts of that movie um but i love the road warrior and like i said fury road was one of my favorites and uh, i thought it was I thought it was a great little entry in the franchise. I'd love to see more of it. I want George Miller to keep making movies because, man, the skill craft that goes into not just the action sequences, because that's second to none, but like I went back, we watched Fury Road again before we, we saw it and just the visual, st what, so, what 99 out of 100 movies would do with exposition and boring dialogue to explain the world, he does it visually in the frame. You have to be looking for it. You have to pay attention. But like he tells you everything you need to know about the world in the frame. And I just think that's so impressive. And I'm I couldn't be a bigger fan. Yeah, I do really like that. That's a, that's a good point. Like as, as someone that's not as familiar with it, I, I do like how much is told without words. Like I was almost surprised that there were like significantly it felt like more lines than in Fury Road, but I could be wrong. Yeah, it seems like it. I think there, it felt like there were more characters, at least. Um, yeah, I mean, Fury Chris Hemsworth was great. Just, <laughs> oh, dude, he was incredible. Yeah, he was probably my highlight, I'd say. I'd probably agree with that. Um, yeah, I just think, uh, you know, when I was writing the movie, I had a, I had a, a flurry of post-its up, and they would change constantly. But the one that was the boldest, with the biggest Sharpie I wrote, that stayed there the whole time, was Show Don't Tell. <laughs> And that's like one of the ba most basic screenwriting rules, but like I, that's something I constantly have to remind myself. And dude, I don't think anything does it better than those movies. Love that, yeah. Show, show, don't tell. I, I always try to keep that in mind as well um, when we're working on stuff. And um, certainly, innovative, cool stuff. You know, very different from what we did. And uh, we could dig in for hours, I'm sure, on that one. But we'll save it for a movie podcast. But while we're on movies, I know you did see another one, right? Yeah, Megan and I saw Babes the night before with Alana Glazer. And that was fun because I didn't see, like, I, I knew she had a movie coming out and I knew I was probably going to see it. But it's very rare for me to not see a trailer, a TV spot, a social media clip. I saw nothing on this movie going into it. And it made it so fun. Like, I mean, kind of the opening 
I don't even know if you'd call it a curveball, but like took me like I'm completely taken by surprise in a way that if I had seen a trailer, I wouldn't be, you know? So it was, it made it easier to just kind of jump in on board. Let's just see what happens. And it was really funny. So well-performed, well-directed, tight paced. I think it was 90 minutes. Um, I like a shorter movie when possible. And this was, this was just, there was not a lot of fat on it. It was a lot of fun. And what's kind of cool is like, I love that it's its own thing, but it 100% could have been a broad city movie, almost like a long episode that like, not as slapsticky as the show, but like, you know, it had some deeper stuff into it, but it was, it was really good. Um, she co-wrote it. Um, and it was, yeah, it was two thumbs up for me. Well, I look forward to checking that out sometime. Um, I watched a movie at home. I watched Dune 2. Have you, I forget, have you watched that yet? You beat me to it, man. I wanted. I kept holding out trying to see it late run in theaters. And I know it was in theaters at least last week. And I just kept not being able to make it. And uh, so, yeah, here I am. I was talking about that with Wadi this morning, too. Yeah, it just it slipped, through me, slipped through my cracks. And I really lo- I watched the first one twice. So I was really hoping to see that one in theaters. How'd you like it? Yeah, I mean, I won't dig in too deep to it, but... Um, you know, I really enjoyed the first one. I ended up having to split this one up unexpectedly and I, maybe that affected my enjoyment of it. I I didn't enjoy it as much as the first one. Like I thought it was solid. Um, but I just recall really enjoying the first one. Um, I just wasn't as engaged with the characters in the story as I was in the first one. Um, like, I don't know if what the consensus generally is. I haven't really read anything or looked at anything about this, but you know, I'd be curious to watch it again, you know, having maybe watched the first one right before and see, see how that goes. Yeah. I think that that's something that probably could be easier to lock into at the theater. Cause that was shot with big format in mind. I, I'm Finn couldn't stop talking about how beautifully it looked. So yeah, that's one I'm disappointed. I let get away from me, but it seemed like every time I was like, okay, I'm going to sneak off and see a noon matinee of this just cause like, that's the time to do it and something would come up and it just like it was week after week of that and uh yeah megan didn't see the first one and wasn't too interested in spending four hours at a movie theater so i which i totally understand so um yeah i I will see it at some point but i'll probably need to watch the first one again honestly yeah yeah i should have well maybe next time um but yeah, I mean, I unless you you have any other any other stuff we want to discuss on the show front? Uh, not really. I'm still slowly getting through Barry. Um, we haven't had as much time to watch this past week, so yeah, man. Um, I'm pumped for a little Shapiro action. Yeah, yeah, we've got Sean Shapiro on this episode. He plays Nick, the goalie uh, for Polly's Pies in the movie. Um, he's also been our launch manager and has been helping us, you know, launch the film in a variety of capacities. You know, he's an NHL writer, does a lot of writing specifically on the stars and Red Wings, you know, on the business of the NHL. He's got his Shap Shots uh, platform for that. Um, I love reading his stuff that even, you know, before I was a friend of his. Um, and yeah, I'm ex- excited for us to get to share this conversation with everyone. John, how's it hanging? Good. Good, good. I did not come nearly as prepared as Tyner, so I'm feeling disappointed. Mm. Yeah, I'm a pro at this now. I've got a few preparations on my end, but um, yeah, I mean, we're excited to talk to you of all people for the show because you've been such a huge part, especially with the launch. Um, It'll be a different conversation than than with some of the other people. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm kind of interested to see how this goes in a formal audio format because I feel like we spend a lot of time around each other already. So it's uh, not sure if this will be a good reflection of our friendship or not. We'll find out. Well, now I'm nervous. (laughs) (laughs) So, all right. You and Tyner went to college together. You went to Bowling Green. Um, So maybe start there with how you guys met. Yeah. Um, so let's see, this would have been my, it was my sophomore year at my, at Bowling Green. I think it was Tyner. I think it was your first year you were there, right? Yeah. I, I was a I transfer for, though. So I was, yeah, I, guess, yeah. I guess technically a sophomore, but yeah. Well, whatever, whatever it was. Yeah. So we, uh, 
I think we basically just met through, we, details are always kind of fuzzy on this part, but basically I can't remember whether it was one, whether it was us going to a drop-in at the same time and whether it was the first time we went to the same drop-in or after a couple times, I'm not really sure. Well, I remember. remember. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll let you, you went. Yeah, yeah, me and yes. you went to a shinny, which yep. growing up in the South, I'd never heard the word shinny, and I had literally had to yep, Google yep, it before yep, yep, I yep. signed up. And we were the only two people there. And, yes, okay, yes, yes, okay. And we linked yeah. up. I, I think where our chemistry sort of hit off from the start was you were a fun, aggressive goalie. So we basically did like an hour straight of shootout attempts and just like yeah, yes, you know, dicking yes. around but really trying, but like – uh, that's when I, I quickly realized, oh, this is a really good goalie. And I've always, whatever it says about me, I've always been pretty tight with like the goalie on the team was usually one of my best friends on any team I grew up on. So yeah, I think we just kind of, you know, we dick around for about 20 minutes at a time and then go chill by the bench, take a breather. And we just started shooting the shit. And I, I think we might, I don't know when the, the ice holes happened I mean, the next semester, maybe. Yeah, because it was, so I do, I, I, I couldn't, now that you're saying it, I remember it right. I couldn't remember if, I knew, I couldn't remember if it was the first time we were ever at the same shinny or if it was, I remember that it was just you and I were there. So I remember that for sure. That was the. To interject briefly on that, I mean, you know, sometimes you can play hockey with guys for years and not really get to know them at all. Like, especially if you're just showing up to like uh, whatever skate, you know? So I think the fact that not a lot of people showed up was probably beneficial for the relationship. And like, you know, the way it goes for Riley during the late game where he like makes these friends, that's, you know, that's something that can happen at a game, but it's kind of the exception to the rule. You know, plenty of us have subbed on teams and never talked to the guys again. Yeah. And I think it's us for, for my, my world, right. As a goalie, um, unless you're, and it's kind of funny that this is the, like, I play the in in the movie, right? Nick's attitude, it's similar to me, but I am in a real life world I'm much more talkative like in the actual locker room. Like I'm actually friendly with people and and other other humans and everything like that. Um the uh, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but as a goalie, right? So, especially at a drop in, there's no way you're getting to know anyone else unless it's the situation like that where it's just one other guy, two other guys. Cause otherwise you're just in the net and people on the bench get to know each other. That's that's why, that's why we're all weirdos and everything. And if, uh, so you either base as a goalie, the only way you're making friends is if attendance is terrible for skaters or if there's too much attendance and you got like four goalies there and it's just awful. And you have to go to, you have to sit on the bench while and do the weird rotation. And it, there's always some goalie that doesn't understand how time or rotation works and, you feel like you have to be the asshole to get him to move and everything. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's like, I think, I think so. Tyner, we hit it off then. Um, I think it was, must've been next. It was, must've, because I think that was the year I was coming off the, that must, I was coming off the knee injury then. Like I hadn't played for, I played a little bit before that, but like I was still coming back from the knee injury. And I think when, um, with the ice holes, I think it was, I can't remember whether I played one season with them and then you joined or we both joined at the same time. I can't remember, but basically I know it was a bunch of the guys who I had kind of come across through various things. They needed a goalie and, and I can't remember whether the, the details are kind of foggy, whether it was you and I both joined at the same time or I did one season and then you joined, but either way we played on that team soon after for what, two and a half years or whatever it was fun team. So Oh yeah. Yeah. Intramural squad. Um, and there was a lot of connective tissue kind of right out the gate. Cause, uh, Brian Hilliard and Ryan Skoyak were on my floor and my, that dorm Bra- Harshman Bromfield, uh, that first I had, I had to be in a dorm. I was a 21 year old transfer that was in a dorm of 18 and 19 year olds. So I felt like the elder statesman. Um, but yeah, that was kind of a fun. And then I don't, I guess Sean Gilbert was on that team. So we kind of, kind of got a, a, a nice little crew together um, kind of right out the gate. Yeah, it was a good group. And like we had, we always had a pretty good time and it was uh, the team. I mean, it was one of those where we were in the, we were always right in the, we were always one of the top two or three teams. We were always one of the, like, there's only like always like a four team league. So we were always like one of the top two teams in the league. And it was, uh, I think we had a couple, uh, we had a couple good experiences. And then like, we also always hit it off pretty well with the, uh, 
with uh like not only did we play the beer league games and that was big but we also went to a bunch of shinny as is, is a word that you learned l- learned through it but like we went through we went to a bunch of those too where we would just have time like all right well we're in college so what the hell else are we gonna do and so we would just go to the rink and that was that was one of the great things like for me one of the reasons i actually picked bowling green um to go to school there was um I wanted a place with a rink on campus. That was actually one of the, like my college, like clarif- clarifications. Like I wanted to go to a place where, whether it was, I want, I wanted to not be a spot where I had to drive, a, a, a drive to go play hockey. I wanted it to be part of my college life. And so that's kind of why Bowling Green fits so well for me. And I think we really embraced that just both beer league team with dropping in and everything like that. It was, it was fun. Well, you're responsible for like two of my, fondest hockey memories especially as a player growing up in the south is during the winter months they had a little at the town park they had a little skating rink for kids basically <laughs> it was probably the size of a offensive zone circle and we would it was right by a roller rink so we'd get nets we'd lug the nets over and we'd play a little three on three short area have our beers in the snow um, and then the coolest thing i've ever done was me, you brought me along the sub on a team and I think Ottawa Park around Toledo, we played at an outdoor rink in a blizzard and it was fucking cool. It was so cool. I loved that rink. It was the, uh, the Ottawa Park League was so, uh, I can't remember what night of the week it was, but it was, it was, it was, it was like the, the quintessential, like, it was like almost like, remember like the old backyard hockey game? It was like if you had designed that, uh, designed a rink from backyard hockey, that's what it looked like. And there's a little like, house you walked into and there was like there was no locker rooms there was like 12 benches or whatever that you just got dressed in and the uh it was it was such a cool setup i think the uh that the, the town the, the the park one where it was like we played a little three on three and we dragged the rinks over that was one of the times we we forced sokoviak to wear pads and it was uh and he just was very sore the next day i remember that too <laughs> so the, yeah. So, you know, you guys bonded over hockey. The movie's very much about, you know, that, how, how hockey is like a good means to bond. I mean, it's an immediate connection if you meet somebody and you find out they play hockey. Um, and, you know, I think that that plays through a lot in the movie with a lot of the friends. You know, I think it's the case with a lot of the friends in the movie. Um, so, Sean, when did you first hear about Tyner writing a movie? about hockey, not, not Shaun of the Dead. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Is that what it was called? No, no. Uh, Shaun of the Dead. Oh, of the Shaun of the Dead's an actual movie. Dawn yes, of the Bros yes. is what I was thinking of. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Dawn Don, Don of the Bros should make it on the, uh, when, whenever we make our uh, blue steel, Blu-ray DVD cases and there's at random extras. You gotta, you gotta dig that up and throw uh, Dawn of the Bros on there. That's uh that was uh, college production. Yes, one of the greatest films of all time, short films of all time. Um, <laughs> uh, I I know it had been mentioned to me. I know I know Tyner and I had talked about this stuff like randomly in passing, like throughout life at times. Like I think there was at one point. I think the first time you may have ever mentioned that it was an idea in your head was. Do you remember like this would have been like twenty? I don't know twenty. 16 or 17 where like i i me and my wife drove to north carolina and we crashed at uh we crashed in which we crashed in, at, in south carolina at, at your at your parents and in, 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 at your parents place on the drive since i was trying to not spend money on hotels and we caught up and everything like that and for some reason i think that was in addition to your mom giving me a couple of her self-published books i i <laughs> i have memories of you at least mentioning something of like you'd want to make a hockey movie someday and maybe i'm just making it sound more romantic than it was but that's that's kind of the that that's one that's one uh memory i have but i knew you were writing it i knew there was an idea but i didn't have an idea but i i really didn't know it was something that was like formally happening until you actually called me about it and you were like, "Hey, we did this, and we're gonna we're gonna do this. We're gonna film this. We're gonna make this movie, and I want you to play goalie in it." And I remember kind of my first reaction was like, uh, "Bud, you know, I only ever really played beer league, right? Like, there's not a this isn't getting uh this isn't getting uh, Bill Ranford to stunt double like like in the movie Miracle. So like, you know, you know that I only ever played uh, ever played beer league. He's like, no, it's great. It's exactly what we need. So that that's when I first heard about it as a, as a real thing. And then you sent me the, 
this. The first time I, I saw a script of it and this was a real thing and we made this all happen. And like, it was from then on, it's kind of just taken on a whole life of its own. And it's awesome. Yeah. From the first draft. Um, I mean, you were the goalie I had in mind for the, the half eye stretch pass. Cause that when we going back to the ice holes intramural team, that was, if we got down a few goals, that became the number one play of <laughs> you try to get the dump attempt and then just sail it to me three quarters down the ice. Uh, so that's, I always had you in mind. Um, so I'm really glad it was able to work out. It's funny because we're recording this now and I'm going to brag about it because I texted you last week to brag about this. But my team I'm currently playing for right now, my Wednesday night team, the Anchorman, we uh, we won 4 nothing last week. And uh, I had the second assist on our goal that made it two rip. So it was uh, it's it's important to brag about this stuff. It's Absolutely. And if you're not good, I mean, this is the place to do it if no one else will hear it, you know? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. This is this is the forum to brag about Beer League. Um and man, I was just starting to think about a, some cool beer league highlights in my head, but none of mine are exciting. Um, all right. So Tyner reached out, you know, you saw this was becoming a real thing. You know, what was the process of committing or Tyner getting Sean to commit to, you know, spending, I think like 12 days with us in, in tr the Charleston area. Yeah. For me, the, one of the things that's been that's super cool about my life and how things have gone, and I have to give my wife credit a ton of things, is my wife has always been very supportive of this weird world I live in, where I have I'm a sports writer. I, I do do a bunch of I don't have a normal human schedule, and I have a and my wife has always been really supportive of everything. So like it was one of those things. Remember I told Tyner about it when he first reached out about it or like this is something that yeah i love this idea i'd love to do it but at the same time i gotta figure out taking two weeks away i've got two little kids they're five and three now so they would have been basically four and 18 months or whatever it was when when we when we shot and so it was uh basically getting just kind of talk to my wife about it. Like, okay, is this something that I'm about to, so I give her a ton of credit for basically being willing to handle the four-year-old and the, the four-year-old and the 18 month old by herself for about two weeks. Just, it was a, so a ton of credit to her on that. And it's, yeah. And uh, so that was kind of once, once I kind of had that support for my wife and never, never, not that I ever, she always supports me in a ton of stuff. I, I work in a field that is incredibly varied and wild in sports media but so once i kind of had that it was it was all aboard for that and it was i loved the kind of went down it was, it was great to take the time down there I'd, I'd been too close to charleston but i've been more to where obviously where you live tyner so i hadn't been to charleston proper before so it was my first time really spending time in charleston um and it was uh i mean it was it was such a cool like setup we had it was i i was roomed with rizzo at the uh, so we, rizzo and i became good good friends and everything like that and all of us did like that was such a cool like and it was my first my first ever movie set experience i had no idea what to expect at all i mean the to me the biggest like kind of eye opener in a good way was we're filming that you're filming that scene with uh with kevin with kevin and riley at the at, in the bathroom and I'm like, oh, okay, it's a five minute. I uh, little do I know. I've never done anything with movies. I'm like, oh, it's a it's a little three minute interaction at most or whatever, right? And you're like, and it takes us. There's like eight hours of watching and have it. I'm like, geez, this is <laughs> cool, but I had no idea that this is like had no idea how this was what made and everything. Exactly. So it was such a eye opening thing for me. And by the end of it, it's like you kind of kind of understand it a bit but it's it was it was cool yeah no i love that aspect of like getting people on sets for the first time and then realizing like yeah hours can go into a few seconds on screen <laughs> yes 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 so all right so you showed up you didn't know what to expect you got to see that it was pretty legit um you know i know we had a great time making the movie um you were uh, a fellow member of the Polly's team with me. Um, like you said, goalie's a little bit different. You weren't always hanging out on the bench. Um, but yeah, what was it like, you know, for me, for those couple of weeks, it was like being on a hockey team again. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was, a, it was like being a team. We all, like, it was, you got to know everyone. You got to, 
one of my favorite parts about made about a hockey team is you get to know so many people um, while talking about nothing and everything at the same time. Right. Like where you're just, you're just chilling. You're talking about, you're, you're shooting the shit about stuff and you may be having, you could, you could have the same tone and tenor about the most serious conversation in the world and the most fucking stupid thing in the world. And at the same time, you're just getting to know all these guys. And it's just such a a great thing. And like, and it was, to me, it's uh, like, it it just, so such a cool reminder. It's very similar to like, my Wednesday night team where um, the, the anchor men who I've been on, I've been on that team now for been playing with those guys for two years now, two and a half years now. And like, since I moved back up to the back up to Michigan and they, it's like, you see them, you see guys each Wednesday, every single Wednesday night, we talk about nothing and everything all at the same time. And that, that's what the pies felt like. That's, that's kind of what it was. I know like in the movie, I'm the like silent spot off in the corner guy, but like we actually, you got along with everyone. It was, it was, uh, you, you made some lifelong friends. You got see, like through this movie, uh, through this movie rollout stuff. Like I've gotten, I like, for example, me and, uh, Tyler, right? Like, so Tyler's when we, when we did our screening in Chicago, I've got, I'm Tyler and I were there for a couple days before kind of as the advanced team. And we had a, we have a really good, just kind of yin yang style of, of, of we both kind of the way I get very mellow at certain times and he gets very hyper. It works very well together. That goes back to, uh, goes back to set and just getting to know each other and becoming friends. So that it felt like a team. It felt a lot like a team and, and not just the, the thing I liked about it, too, it wasn't just the guys on, not just the pie guys, but it was also like, it was the, it was everyone kind of like, felt like kind of like a cool little family on staff with, on, with everyone. So that was, that that was so cool. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, it was a pretty incredible experience and i um, really thankful that we got to experience it. And uh, we can, I do want to dig in a little more to launch, but first I'm curious kind of when, where, how your relationship with hockey started. So I grew up in North Jersey in New Jersey. Um, you only really have to say North or South Jersey. If you're actually talking to somebody else from New Jersey, every, every time, like, so, but it's just a default setting for me. So I grew up in, I grew up in New Jersey and I'm let's, I grew up in a soccer house. That was a, the big thing. My dad was, my dad played college soccer. Um, I have a sister who ended up playing college soccer. We went to, we had season tickets to the old Metro stars when that was still an MLS team in the, in like night when that league started in like 96 or 97 or whatever it was. But, but being, but I found, I kind of hockey was the thing I kind of found myself. And so there was a summer rec program and God knows this type of program would never be approved in today's day and world. And I even say that as, as a, as a, as a parent with children, there's a summer rec program where it was basically Monday through Friday in the summer. There was a, um, in, in kind of in the town we live in, the, the, near one of the bigger neighborhoods, Monday through Friday, there's a program where you dropped off the kids, you dropped off the kids to play roller hockey. And they basically put a big plastic barrier in front of the, in front of the thing to separate it from the main road. And that's all there was. And there was two and there was, and you basically played from like nine to 11 or whatever. And then the kids, and then the kids would then rollerblade with their bet ba- ba- with holding their bags back to like this kind of like, like community center or whatever, where it was technically hosted. And then mom and dad would pick you up at lunchtime. And it was, uh, and it was run by, of course, like, 13 and 14 year old teenagers who didn't have cell phones at the time. So it was like, no one knew, like, if, like it's the type of thing that would just send all sorts of red flags to anyone trying to send their kid to do something now. And so there was two games though, every time. So there was a big, like open, big open, uh, parking lot where they had two goals and everything like that. And, um, that's where basically a bunch of the younger kids, everything like that, like, and then there was, we called it the cage. There was the basketball cage, which was, which was smaller and everything like that. And basically that was the much better kids, the older kids, the fourth, the fourth, fifth graders and everything like that. And, um, I'm in third or second or third grade or whenever, when this happens and everything that, and, and all of that. And 
basically, um, first couple weeks we're there, it's like I go and play, like I'm playing goalie in the way that's like, I'm just standing in front without gear. Like, it's just kind of like the one in the big parking lot. There was just like a random kid. Cause it's like the game is like the game in the big parking lot to be clear is like 20 on 20. No, like, it's just like 20. It's like, just imagine and no changes. Just imagine 40 kids, just like basically all just like bumble bunch of 40 second and third graders first, second, third graders, just all like all completely unsupervised, just chasing a ball. And then there's two, and then there's two kind of like, pseudo nets and so i just started standing in front of the one because i didn't like going with the group of 40 and i and so but i'm not playing in goalie gear or anything like that and um after one of those i kind of got the i asked my mom and like i i really would want to try and play goalie can we get and so like i got like the old black so she we went to the store and i got like the black mylex street the street yep. hockey pads I, and I had some of those oh, yeah. yeah and so um there was the first time, the first time we ever did that. So for, we go there, and so I bring bring the, the actual goalie gear. I got the street hockey pads, and first time in that big like big open, big open parking lot. And then happens there once, and then older kids, better kids, or whatever, they're like, "Oh, you actually want to play goalie?" And so I get invited to come play in like this actual real hockey game because like the, the game inside the cage and everything like that is basically it was probably it wasn't five on five but it was it wasn't the 40 on 40 it was probably like seven on seven and and whatever and two goalies and, and i'm the only one that's not like an older kid and all of this and i got but i got to play goalie in it and so that's how i like that to me was how i like found the sport playing at first and then and that was in the summer and everything like that and then that's when I kind of became a, and, and that that's how I became, then I started watching the NHL more because of that. So um, like, so obviously it's, that's kind of the era of being in New Jersey. Um, I was a huge Devils fan because, and a huge Devils fan and being a goalie, it's the heyday of Brodeur's you're watching Brodeur all the time and everything like that. And so you, you start, you start, you start with that. And it was one of the great things about where I lived from a hockey fandom perspective is like now it's easy right you can watch any game you've got all this as much as people like as much as sometimes it's hard to watch games than it should be it's actually really easy to watch as many games as you want compared to forever ago like and so being being in being in new jersey we were in the tv market for the devils the rangers the islanders and then if one of them weren't playing that night msg also had the sabers games so it was kind of as a kid, I was able to just I could always flip on the TV and you could essentially as 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 you got older, it went it went from watching. It was always you could watch you could watch Brodeur every night. I could watch I could watch Hashik probably could watch about half of all the Sabres games. I could watch Hashik play. You have all you there's always a game on TV just based off the geography of where I lived. And that's just kind of how I got more hooked and everything like that. And it's funny, it was just for me, it was just street hockey for about three or four years. Like I didn't actually, I never learned to, it's funny. I say this now because I have a five-year-old daughter who's starting to play hockey and just ice skating and everything. I didn't, I never learned to ice skate until, uh, first time I ever ice skated was in goalie pads. I never learned to skate as a child. Like I was, it was, uh, summer. First time I ever, played ice hockey was it was the summer between sixth and seventh grade for me where I went to like a like a beginning hockey camp and all these other kids are like there in regular gear and I'm the one who shows up in goalie gear and they're like you know this isn't a goalie camp I'm like no but I've never played before and like so I first time I ever learned to skate on ice was in goalie gear in goalie skates and, and everything like that and just kind of took off and just kind of has been part of my life really ever since. Yeah, it's it's really cool to see how hockey sort of gets into your brain, sticks around, and takes over. Um, that was definitely the case for me. And you know, we didn't have the the fortune of watching as many games locally. I know at, at one point in my childhood, I convinced my parents to get Center Ice, the the TV package. But um, you know, once the Hurricanes showed up in the late '90s, we could turn them on occasionally, and 
you know, maybe some Thrashers games in their years, but uh, to be able to have all those New York area teams uh, available, that's, that's awesome, especially during Brodor and Hashik's career. Yeah. And it was also it kind of, it started reflecting too, right? Like eventually um, as I was get a little bit older, that's when Lundquist comes into the league right there. And you've got, you have, and for, I remember at one point for like about three weeks, they tried to pretend that Rick DiPietro was on an equal level to, 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 to the long right in Britain. The 15 year yeah, yes, here. exactly. So uh, they, they tried to, but it was, it was a great, it was kind of like a golden time for, for, for goaltending. It's kind of funny. Like it's, I, I look at it now where it's like, it's in the New York area, right? Like it's between Sorokin and Shesterkin. Obviously Sorokin had the tougher playoffs for the Islanders than, than he should have. But uh, like it's, if the devils just went and got a real goalie, it would be kind of the best trio goaltending they've had there in 20 and 20 and since kind of the heyday for it. And if Devin Levi really lives up to his hype, then there we go. We're getting really close to crowning the Stanley cup champion. With the action heating up on the ice, it's even hotter at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL. New to DraftKings? Listen up. New customers can get a no-sweat bet up to $1,500. Just deposit at least 5 bucks, and you'll get a bonus bet back equal to your first bet if it doesn't hit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code THPN. That's code THPN for new customers to get a no-sweat bet up to $1,500 if your first bet doesn't hit. Only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in West Virginia, visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario, one no sweat bet per new customer. Issued as one bonus bet based on amount of initial losing bet. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.co slash ice for eligibility. Wagering and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. Copyright NHL 2024. All rights reserved. One of the things that we tout about the late game is everybody that plays hockey and it plays hockey in real life. Certainly one of my favorite aspects about it, like I was telling somebody at our Friday skate about it, one of the younger kids that was in town from college who didn't know a lot about it. And that was like one of his first questions, like, well, is it real hockey players? I'm like, I mean, yeah, if you consider beer leaguers real hockey players. You consider Kevin yeah. a hockey player. Yeah, if you consider <laughs> Kevin a hockey player. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's one of my my favorite aspects. And so, you know, I think – combining the fact that like we're getting to make a movie with our friends, it's like all doing something that we love and that's been a big part of our lives. And for you in particular, you know, hockey has been a huge part of your livelihood in general. So it was, I think a cool extension of that. And so maybe give me a little bit of background on, you know, your hockey writing career and what you're up to now. Yeah, for sure. So like, it's funny. I had the classic, I had the classic example of I was one of the many kids who was like when they ask, oh, what are you going to be when you're going to grow up? And I always I was going to be a pro athlete. Right. We all we're, we're all going to be a pro athlete until at some point we realize that, well, we're not all going to be. pro. We're not. <laughs> so um, so I I it's funny. I have the. I started writing first, quote unquote, published story. I dug it up about a year and a half ago. I found it digging somewhere in that closet behind me there. Uh, when I was in middle school, there was a student newspaper. And when I say newspaper, I use newspaper in the loosest of terms. It is a, there was an English teacher who technically ran it. And it was a, it was probably about 25 pages of eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper stapled together and then designed an old like Microsoft, like whatever the format was or whatever. And so it was the 2000, I wrote a preview for a season preview for the 2002-2003 NHL season. And it is riddled with spelling errors and grammatical mistakes. It is incredibly embarrassing to read it now. Uh, but it was the like first time I ever wrote something like like published or whatever. And and it's, it was a and there's like there was one line about each there was one line about all 30 
yeah, all, there was 30 at the time, all 30, all, one line about all 30 NHL teams and, and, and everything like that. And so, and like every, that, that student paper or whatever it was came out every, I think there was like four a year or whatever. So I did that in middle school. And then, um, and that's kind of when I kind of got the, the first like writing bug of like, oh, this is cool. I can actually write stuff and I could see my name in print. And then um, when I moved, when I was 15, for me, I, when I was 15, I moved from New Jersey to Michigan. And that was a big part of my life for various reasons. You're 15 and you move, you're impacted quite a bit either way. But from a positive perspective, and obviously positive enough that I now live back in Michigan because it was still, but um, from a positive perspective, A, the hockey got a lot better. Like I went from playing hockey I played hockey as a varsity hockey, New Jersey, as a freshman in New Jersey to going to Michigan where I didn't even make the JV team in, in Michigan. And it was kind of like the, this kind of eye opening thing. Now it made me better and all this other stuff, but from a writing like future career perspective, it was kind of cool. The high school I went to had a school newspaper journalism program that was actually a class. So you could take it during the day. And so like we had this, so you could, one of your, one of your, when we had block scheduling. And so one of your classes was one of my classes was, was literally newspaper. And, um, I got to kind of live and learn and put, put help, put out a, a monthly newspaper for all three years of, of high school and everything. Um, by the time my senior year, uh, was around, we had these, we had, with these block schedules, we had like this setup where I don't know if kids even do this anymore, but like we had the block schedules where there were seven classes and it was like, like uh tuesday and tuesday and thursday you only had classes two four and six and you got them in 90 minute blocks right and so my senior year of high school i was taking the newspaper class i was taking the quote-unquote yearbook class even though i actually didn't work on the yearbook i only worked on the newspaper and then i took an independent and then i took an independent study an independent study in journalism and so my tuesday and thursdays my senior year of high school i I did not. I drove to school. I went to the school newspaper room. I basically just read and wrote and did all stuff like, and so that was just a huge, like for me, that was kind of put me, that's when I kind of knew that this is what I want to do. I want to write for a living. I realized that I was not going to be a professional athlete. I, I had kind of come to that uh, conclusion. And so I went to, went to Bowling Green where obviously from a hockey life perspective, met my great friend Tyner here, but, um, just also it was another place I went where I got to cover the sport. And it's like, I wanted the rink on campus when I went to college so I could play myself, but also, so there was a division one team so I could get some experience covering it. And then, so I spent basically, I started, I I basically, I went to, I started covering things for newspapers and everything like that. Hockey was always my favorite sport, but, um, it wasn't really to kind of fast forward a bit here. Like I got a job in a small town, a small town paper in Texas, right out of school in Kerrville, Texas, no hockey there, obviously. Um, but I had, uh, I went to my second job was right outside of Austin, Texas in Cedar park, Texas. And there was a little weekly newspaper and everything like that, where I was the, I was the sports editor and then also covered stuff for the Austin American Statesman, the daily paper, the big daily paper in Austin. And, uh, because I was my technical boss for the weekly sports section, I was allowed to basically be like, oh, I can decide that the AHL team, the Texas Stars, are part of my coverage. I couldn't ever do it over, like I could never go to a Texas Stars game over a high school football game. Like that was not going to be, that was not, that was not going to be kosher. But I could do, but I could go and on the Tuesday night games, the Saturday games, I could go and cover the AHL. And so I basically kind of, I covered that team I covered that team in addition to doing my other job. At one point I had one of, I, I had my unfortunate, this is journalism moments where I had a job that was completely eliminated and we stayed down there and, and at the paper, but then I continued to cover the Texas stars on my own kind of freelance basis, everything like that. And that led to, and that kind of led me to the NHL opportunity. And um, this is the thing where like, sometimes I talk to people and they're like, Oh, how did you get to cover the NHL? And, I basically tell people it's, I turned down a, um, I turn I took a big risk and turned down a full-time job covering football recruiting to take a, to move to Dallas. Basically. Um, I was, I'll always remember this. I had accepted the job, um, 
to be the recruiting insider, quote unquote, for the Austin American Statesman. They were going to, after a couple of years after they had let me go, they had found, created another job. They were going to bring me back to work covering high school football recruiting. Um, and I had already sort of done a little bit of the work. Like I had been like, they said like, oh, let, let's hire you to do a couple freelance stories. Like, so I drove out to LaGrange, Texas, about an hour and a half. And J.K. Dobbins didn't show up to the interview. So I, uh, I, I have every, so as I know, so every time I see J.K. Dobbins on a screen, whenever he's not blowing out his knee, which is kind of ironic considering my own past knee his issues, I always get frustrated because he took an hour, three hours of my life because he did not show up to the interview as a, as a, as a high school, as a college football recruit. And, but so I, I'm taking, I accept the job. I go and get the drug test. And I'm actually driving home from the drug test to, uh, and that's when I get a call from an unknown New York number a guy by the name of, uh, from, uh, Barry Rubenstein, who is the NHL.com editor. And Barry calls me, he says, Hey, um, I know you're not in Dallas, but we have an opening for the NHL.com part-time position in Dallas. Would you be interested in that? And I said, yeah, oh yeah, of course. I'd... And so now this was not a full-time job. It was a part-time game to game basis, but, I effectively made the decision to move to move my me and my wife Christina moved from. We, I called Jason Jarrett, who was the sports editor at the Statesman, who's now who's still now a good friend. I was worried about how burning that bridge would go, but tell him that hey, uh, the job you offered I don't want anymore. I'm going to go take a part time job in Dallas and move my entire life. And I did that, and so I, I went there, um, covered the Dallas Stars for NHL.com. I was part of the uh, I was part of the glory days for the athletic when the company was was still when there was 32 beat writers for all 32 teams and everything and then um, and then basically it was it was it was I covered the stars and COVID kind of hit I covered the stars through the end of that bubble and then um, after COVID I decided to basically move my my family up to Michigan back to be closer where my kids could grow up knowing their family and everything like that. And me and the athletic parted ways. And I've since now kind of gone into the independent sports media space. That's been really fascinating and cool at the same time. Right. So I work with the guys over at elite prospects. Um, I work on their site as a, as a writer, but then this year I started working as a goalie scout for them as well. Um, yesterday I was randomly watching Slovakian tier two hockey for the draft guide, <laughs> like just watching, just watching, watching goalie stuff. Uh, I get to be incredibly nerdy about the things I like. Um, I have my own site that I, that I launched through Substack. that it's kind of cool that recording this now. I hit a pretty cool milestone with that, where it's got more than 500 paid readers and more than 2000 readers overall that just kind of in this, in, in this independent sports media world. And, and so it's like, it's been, it's, I get to kind of, I live this and you can, I add the movie into this part because like we did the movie and now it's been kind of cool to do all this, this launch stuff. And I feel like, I feel like Zucker and I become really good friends through this, even though we hadn't known each other at all before the movie. Like I now get to kind of live in this weird hockey world where I get to touch so many parts and bases of it. And it's, it's been really fun. Yeah. Agreed. And I'll note that I am a, a proud Shapshot subscriber and like, you know, you mostly cover the stars and the wings among other topics. And despite my not being a huge stars or wings fan, I really enjoy that coverage. But like, you know, maybe if it's digging in on a stars prospect, I might not read it all. But then you also have like, I got the lucky uh, enjoyment of watching you cover the Avs and stars series and like. I forwarded one of your summaries to like one of the 2020s or is that what you call them? Yeah. 2020s, uh, yeah. I forwarded one to an abs friend and he's like, man, I wish this guy covered all my games, <laughs> uh, like all the yeah. abs games. Yeah. And I was like, yep, yeah. same. Um, so yeah, I really enjoy your stuff. You have really unique perspectives, especially on like hockey business and the hockey media world. Um, I love that piece on the ducks uh, media platform and so, yeah, I just I wanted to take the moment to suggest to anybody that is consuming this podcast to check out becoming a Shapshot subscriber. And is that what's what's the website? Shapshotshockey.com. Yeah, we do. We have Shapshotshockey.com. And then I was also smart and bought the URL for Shapshots.hockey as well. So that works as well. I uh, that was a that was a savvy business move on my part of making sure I hopped on that before. <laughs> 
Well, it's, it seems like you've been on, you know, quite the journey in media and hockey media. And I mean, I, I certainly think it sounds like a cool spot where you've landed, where you get to work with different entities on things that you enjoy and care about, you get to nerd out on things. And, you know, you've been so helpful as the launch manager with the late game. Um, and yeah, agreed, you know, we've become great friends and it's been great working together uh, and, you know, excited to continue to build out the late game brand. And yeah, I mean, where do you, what are you hoping for? Do you have any further hopes in terms of where your career goes, if you become a movie star, et cetera? <laughs> um, I, I think for me, one of the cool things about my life is I've realized that you can set certain goals and then they can change all the time. Like, for example, I had one goal that I did reach. I got the, I had a goal at one point where I wanted to be an NHL full-time beat writer by the time I was 30. And I, I did, I, I was, I got the stars full-time beat job, like actual full-time, didn't have to do anything else at the time when I was, I think it was 29. So I was, I, I hit or I hit that goal and I was very, I was very happy about it. And now I'm 35 now and I have the, um, that's something where that's no longer my goal anymore because I have, it's the NHL beat is an incredibly fun job, but traveling to cover and covering all 82 games of an NHL team that doesn't leave a lot of time in life to be a good dad. And like one of my favorite things to like yesterday, I was at the rink with my, with, with, with my daughter Evie and she's doing learn, she's doing learn to play hockey right now and everything like that. And I get to times to do that. And so like, my, so my kind of there's been like there's a couple like projects that I've like I've always wanted to do like I've written that in this kind of independent space that have been great so like I wrote a I wrote a book last year uh, about the Texas Stars that I just did because me and a good friend Stephen Meserve had always had these years longs of just conversations at at bars of just like, Oh, we should write a book about this. And we just finally did it. And so like, I'd love to, for me, like in, and on that side of the career is like, I'd love to do probably going to write another book soon. That's I don't know what yet, but I, I will probably write another book in the hockey space. That's kind of on the, on the docket. I, I, I get, I still get such an incredible rush from picking up something and seeing my name on the spine. That's, that's, it's a lot of work that goes into it, but I still like that, that part that payoff is incredible. I, so I'll probably write another book soon. I'm, it's been really cool for me to grow my own product as a brand into something that actually means something to others. Right. Like it's one thing to be like, like, I, I know that my opinion, my work stands for itself. I don't need a larger company to back me up to say, Oh, you have to trust this guy or whatever. Like I, I love that my, my name and work stands for itself. So that's kind of that goal as it keeps going. The I'd love to, when it comes to like, I, I hope for, for this movie world, right? Like I, I, I hope that we, I hope that we have some more out of this, that we kind of pull out of that because I thought it was such a cool thing to be involved with and something that I, that's the reason that I'm, we're, we're working now with, I'm working with you now as the launch manager too, is like this space where we get to kind of see how to build a brand, where it goes, different ways to kind of connect it with others. We did the thing with Skull and Steel last week from the, from the card break. I'm learning all about that stuff. To me, I just kind of want to keep like learning about the world from my own bubble and keep expanding my bubble on this. And um, there's other ideas too. Like I'd, I'd love to get into with our late game space. I'd love for us as we kind of grow this thing to be this space where we tell more and more of those beer league stories. And we've already started doing a little bit of it, right? With those kind of like beer league confessions and everything yeah, like that. But, but exactly. And there's, but I, I'd love to start, I'd love for us to keep kind of going and pushing that where this becomes, we grow into this kind of space and the late game kind of becomes this anchor point for here. Are, here's where people talk about beer league stories. Here's where people, people use this as a connectivity point to find others. And that that's kind of one of the things I get really excited about. Cause I think there's a lot of potential for this stuff. So yeah, definitely. And there's some good brands out there that or you know, some we're working with, some we can model after, et cetera. And, you know, I think it'd be interesting to see like how many of your colleagues in covering hockey media play beer league and to have a discussion around that. It's it, and to, to me, it's the, the other thing is like, 
it's it's been a good I consider myself a little bit of like the when it comes to like hockey media and this and everything I have so many experiences now and part of it was I I had a unfort I was unfortunate how it happened and stuff but I had I had a separation from a good job that that where I was kind of in one box and by being in able to kind of do what I want, how I want with, with work with who I want to, I've been able to kind of do a lot of really cool things in the hockey world that I don't think others get the freedom to do. Right. Like the, to being able to, to be able to part of a movie launch. If I'm working for one full-time employer or whatever, I'm not getting the leeway to do this. Um, I have a, I have a, my good friend Prashant Iyer and I, we do a uh, hockey analytics podcast called Expected by Whom, where like any, every, no one, no, yeah, no one else, we're not getting, I'm not getting, if I have, if I'm working for a company, I'm not getting the green light to go work with an, another project on, with, with Prashant on that, where we get to nerd out about kind of find these things. And like, so no, no one else in the hockey world, I think, and I feel, I feel pretty confidence saying i don't think anyone else in the hockey world has the range i do in coverage like i i I feel like i'm the only person who can go from writing about the business of an audio network the ducks are running to the to writing about whether how teams handle power play entries and then write about a prospect for a team I, i think i truly think that I have, and I think some other people could do it, but I don't think they're anyone. They, they, they don't. don't. I don't think they. Yeah. They, 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 they also don't, and they don't. Can't they, send a half ice saucer pass in a major correct picture. So correct, correct, <laughs> correct, on, correct, correct. I think you're on the right track. from the net. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> correct. So I am. Uh, I I think that I get to kind of live in this world where I get to be myself, and one of the things that's been kind of weird but cool at the same time is. I've kind of accepted that who I am is actually kind of unique in the hockey world. And that's kind of exciting all at the same time. So that's cool. Yeah, no, I, I love that. It's a good summary. You are, are a, a Renaissance man of hockey. <laughs> I guess it's a good way to put it. <laughs> it's a good way to put it. I like that. You know, the other thing I wanted to just bring up before we start to wrap here is, you know, are we leaving anything out Tyner of asking Sean that the audience is going to want to know people that saw him perform as Nick, the goalie with his Jim Craig style performance, other than the fact that he is as good, if not better than Nick, the character. Oh man. I mean, well, first off, I've had multiple people ask me if I'm in the movie. And then when I say yes, because I body double Proton and I'm also a young Gino in a few scenes, um, everyone just, not everyone, but I mean, at least half a dozen people have been like, oh yeah, because you're the goalie, right? Like the, we have that real sexy shot of you getting some water in the shootout, yeah. and they just they see that reddish beard and they just oh that's Tyner, you know. Um, so that's it's a full red beard episode. Yeah, so I'll say yep. this: yep. there's no body double for for Sean as Nick. It's it's him the whole way. Um, it's even him in the you, other net sometimes. Yeah, at least <laughs> in the background. One shot of the movie, he yes, is the yeah. young Geno's goalie too. I won't yes. spoil which one yes. it is. Yes. <laughs> but I mean, he's um, you just got the look of a goalie, man. And I didn't even know you had a cat eye mask until you showed up. Because last time we played together, you had the cage, and I was like, oh fuck, that's hot. And I was like, I, I the first thing I thought was I was just like, man, to get a good glove save with that, with that, ugh. it's just. I don't know, man. Um, it's I'm so it's kind of crazy to hear you break it down earlier in the episode that like, yeah, if that was a, a normal shinny, we don't get to know each other. <laughs> but because it's just the two of us dicking around. And like I said, we I think we just hit it off. Right. And I mean, we can't I don't think we can close the episode. I'll fall on my own sword here that um, a running thing that sh- that me and Sean have, especially when I was a more active NHL viewer, is when we were dicking around at a pickup or something that Sean pulled the, the behind the back glove save on me. <laughs> um, he never misses an opportunity to send me the highlights when it happens in an NHL game. So I've gotten <laughs> quite a few of those over the years. That was in the script too, by the way, is you were going to make a save like that. And then we rejiggered some stuff and it kind of got lost in the shuffle. So that's something we can at least work towards in the sequel, but nah, Sean's the real deal. Um, and we're so we're so stoked to have you in the fam. It's just so cool to see all my friends intermingle. Now everyone knows each other. 
Yeah, it's awesome. No, it's it's been really it's been that's been one of the cooler things for me. Like I sometimes uh like I was I, I think it's so cool where like hockey people get along so well in general, right? That's kind of a thing where like I, th- I think that's you naturally find connective points and ways to hang out and everything. But like the fact that I have a heart it's sometimes it's hard for me to believe that like a lot of these guys, like you, Zucker, like we had never we're great friends now. We had never known each other before. Jeez, how long has it been now since we I'd heard stories Shum? of the great Sean Shapiro, though. Yeah, but we but we weren't friends. Like no, we didn't know. know each we didn't know each other. But like it was <laughs> so it's it was uh but like now it's it's a, it's like a great the, the the pies are a great family. We got the pie guy chat going and everything. So it's 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 it's, it's great. Like I, I always look forward to the we were. Z and I were talking earlier today about what's next, what we're working on next. And it's, I always get excited about how we can keep building this thing. Oh yeah. I was trying to think, um, since Nick doesn't really, especially in a pre-shooting script, Nick had like no lines. So I'm curious, were you ever in on, I can't remember if you were ever in on any of the table reads we did sort of leading up to shooting. I was in on, I think I was in on two of the like zoom reads we did like before. So, So yeah, yeah. Um, but that was that was about it like that was the so but and it was very but because of how few because of how few lines nick has in the script it was very much it it didn't it wasn't really a good reflective this is how you get to know guys and and everything like that it was very much like oh okay this is happening and then it, it really you fly to Charleston. I had to buy a new. Uh, <laughs> I, I had to buy a new hockey bag to, to fly to Charleston because I hadn't. I was using the same bag that zipper had broken years ago and and everything like that. So I had to. I had to go buy a, a new hockey bag so we could so I could fly my gear to Charleston without it all falling all over the place and everything like that. So it was a also shout out to your gear by the way. Um, that coho blocker man. Mm, I didn't know about that either till I saw it in person and boy, was that a beaut. Agreed. Oh, I love that thing. Yeah. I love that thing. The thing we have to figure out, the thing I have to figure out right now is cause I love the, I keep looking on the internet for it. And so if anyone knows and has a line on this, um, my, my black and yellow Reeboks are hitting, starting to hit the end of life. We are at the spot where straps are starting to like, now those pads I have had since those pads I've now had since 2000 I be, I want to say 2012 I think I think I think those things are uh, they've had a good life. Well maybe there's someone from a manufacturing or retail hockey company listening that would like to outfit you with some beautiful poly's colored pads. Yes. Cause that would, that would be nice. And it goes well, it would go well too with the, with the, with the anchor men we've got, we're not purple and yellow, but we got the, we, we have the beige, uh, we got the beige Jersey for the anchor men, which goes, so the, it goes well with that too. So it's, uh, definitely, uh, open to, uh, open, always be selling, I guess, open to all opportunities here on that one, on that front, if anyone is out there listening. So, um, but yeah, that's the, the pads there. They're at the, uh, it's always funny to me when I play, um, like when I play my games on, on Wednesday nights here, I will, will occasionally get the, occasionally you'll play against the younger kid who's something up in a beer league game or you'll play, but like, I don't think I've ever played against someone who has older pads than me at this point. Like, I think like my pads being like nearly like being 12, 13 years old. Now, I think it's the spot where like, they're just the, they're, they're the antiques, but we still get the job done. So, but they're, they're, they're starting at the end of life at some point they They can only go for so long. I mean, you might get even better once you have, once you have lighter pads. I, the, the, key, the key, and we had this discussion when we filmed the movie, because in the scene where I, I'm the, the Gino's goalie, I have never played with the under the knee, the under the pad knee pad ever in my life. Yeah, because I've only I was my pads are still from the age when the goalie was still allowed the thigh board, and th- those are those are not allowed anymore. And uh, so that's the other that's the other key for me. It's like any pad I have to find, I'm gonna have to find someone who's gonna still put a, a thigh board back on it because I'm not gonna go. I, I don't I don't need I already wear three braces on my right knee when I play. I don't need to add an extra knee pad on top of that as well. I need the thigh board on the pad. So 
add that note to anyone who's uh, looking for uh, who wants to uh, drop an email and note about that from pad equipment companies. So <laughs> awesome. Well, I think that that's a good spot to end it, you know, with the, the message that you're open to goalie pad sponsorships. Um, you know, it's been amazing working with you on the movie. Um, excited to continue to grow the late game brand together. And uh, yeah, keep hanging out. Yeah, for sure.